Hello, everyone, and welcome, uh, or welcome back, uh, depending on if you've been with us before today. Um, you are again joining the Wintergreen Studios seventh annual Land Art Bio Blitz. And you've arrived at the session where we are going to have a live virtual behind the scenes tour of the Sandy Pines Wildlife Center, which is pretty amazing because as I understand it, it's not always open to the public. So this is a unique chance for us to see what goes on um, behind closed doors. My name is Rosie and I'm the coordinator of BioBlitz this year and I'll be your host today. So I am happy to welcome uh, two of the staff of Sandy Pines Wildlife Center. Um, both Jess Pilo, who is the education coordinator, as well as Leah Birmingham, who is the veterinary technologist that manages the patient care at, our, at the Wildlife Hospital. Um, so if Jess is there, um, she can maybe turn it on and wave hello. I will, there's Jess, she's gonna start us off and then she will go find Leah um, to go further. So I'll hand it over now to Jess. Uh, thank you so much, Jess. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate. My name's Jess. I'm the education coordinator at City Science Wildlife Center. Welcome to everyone who has joined us today. We are a wildlife hospital in Napanee, Ontario, and we were not the first people to be on this land. Many of the staff who work here, including myself, are settlers, and settlers have a long history of causing harm to wildlife and also causing harm to the Indigenous community whose land we are on. In Napanee and in the Kingston area, those communities are the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee, who are still very present here today. When settlers took this land in the 1700s, Wildlife were no longer offered the deep respect that they were given for thousands of years by Indigenous communities. And this strained relationship between humans and wildlife persists in settler culture today. And we see this firsthand at the hospital. We are working hard to repair this relationship by rehabilitating wildlife. But our work here to honor wildlife and honor Indigenous communities does not end. Here. So as we tour the facility and we see the cases of human caused harm to wildlife, we will share actions that you can take to nurture a more compassionate relationship with wild animals. And we hope that you are inspired to practice these actions in your community. So taking us on the tour today is Leah Birmingham and Leah is the medical director at the hospital. And I'm going to take a look around to see where Leah might be at. We have quite a busy day here at the hospital with lots of patients coming into triage. So we'll check in triage first and then see what other rooms Leah might find themselves in. So we're just walking down our main hallway here. And I'm going to pop into triage first, and it does look like the at your there, but I'm going to flip my camera around before we do that. Let's try that again. There we go. All right, let's head inside to Hello. We haven't started yet, have we? We sure have. Oh, we have. We are on. I'll get my mask <laughs> So we are in triage right now. And as I said, it's been quite a busy day as Leah can attest to. Yes. So Leah, what is going on in oh, here? Terry. Um, well, as typical for spring at a wildlife center, we've had a plunger. It's actually looking pretty good right now. Earlier, Jess tried to come in the room and there literally wasn't enough floor space for the two of us in here. So um, animals are just coming in. People have found them coming in in boxes, coming in in crates, coming in just in nests in people's hands uh, and so then we have a variety of different cages that we try to set them in well we go through each and every one of them and do a physical exam on them and then find what room they're going to go to next from here 
So triage at this time of year is a hop in place most days, but this has been incredibly uh, busy, even more so than our usual. So thankfully I've got a great team and I had a couple of extra team members that are no longer with us, but have stopped in to help out today. And so they helped clear through some of them, which was good because I was pretty stressed because uh, everybody, of course, coming in need care pretty much immediately. They either need, they're hypothermic, they need, uh, they need a heat source, uh, they need us to go over them with a fine tooth comb, basically, and make sure that there's no trauma or injuries that are going to prevent them from being releasable, because then we would just make the decision to euthanize them at the moment rather than put them through uh, the stress uh, of care, because most wildlife are very stressed in our care. So even though we try to respect their wild nature and make sure we don't do anything that stresses them out too much, it's almost impossible not to because of their very nature of being wild. So when this room is full of all these high stress patients, I get a little stressed <laughs> too. Uh, so we're, we're sorting through them slowly but surely, but some of the guys we have in here that I can show you. Uh, this barred owl came in, this is a young, um, barred owl that was found in somebody's pool. And so he's one of the ones we're, we're sorting through. So I've just got him on heat right now to warm up. And uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we could potentially get him back to where he was from because I think he just unfortunately fell in the pool. And if everything is fine with him, uh, he can go back to where his parents are and continue to learn how to hunt from them. Uh, so that's the hope with him is that he's a short stay. Uh, and then we have a raven that's come in earlier that is unable to fly and we still need to do his physical. So he's also wet because of the rain. He is a juvenile as well. Uh, and so he's been on some heat warming up um, just and you'll notice we keep it nice and dark in here so it's low stress for them. So he's just uh, sitting there right now warming up. What squirrel? The squirrel that had been shot. He is no longer with us. Oh, okay. We had a squirrel brought in that was um, badly paralyzed from a BB. So unfortunately, we see far too much of this. Um, kids with BB guns that out taking target practice on uh, wildlife, uh, which is why we've got Jeff doing an outreach program. Uh, to try to teach these children to understand that these animals have families and feelings and uh, maybe not to the same level that humans do, but certainly um, enough that they should be respected and that they suffer from a great deal of pain. And uh, we, we're fortunate that we have the ability to end that pain for them, but we wish that we could just stop the whole process from happening. As far as I'm concerned, BB guns should just be illegal and it should no longer be considered a fun thing for kids to do. Uh, because the majority of those babies end up in squirrels and other wildlife and we get them here and they're paralyzed they've been surviving for however long by dragging their hind end uh, it's just really horrendous what what we see trauma wise and um, you know some some of the trauma we see is is unfortunate and just due to humans and wildlife um, it's uh, you know it just happens like uh, animals getting hit by a car you know, some of those scenarios, it's not intentional. It's just a bird flew in front of the car and the people couldn't stop. But what we'd really like to do is stop the situations like that where wildlife are being persecuted for fun uh, or, you know, if somebody just simply sees it as an annoyance and so they want it off their property, so they use a BB to, to shoot it. And then uh, as far as they're concerned, they don't see the animal again and they think that, you know, they've solved their problem. And um, unfortunately that animal suffers a great, a great deal of time. And then even if it does get eaten by a predator, we're concerned now about a predator ingesting something that's a foreign body that it shouldn't have in it and could cause complications uh, for that, which is the same as you see in, in eagles that get lead poisoning from eating uh, carrion that, that was shot with lead bullets. So anything that we can prevent, uh, we would like to we would like to prevent from happening uh, because we would be busy enough just dealing with all the unpreventable stuff, uh, let alone uh, dealing with the, the things that um, humans could make a better choice on. So yeah, so I think we've cleared out 
most patients, and we can probably do a bit of a tour through now. So why don't we go on over to Songbird Room and uh, take a look at how busy that is these days. <laughs> hey, Laura. Favorite called Connie Black and see if she would take the swallow. Okay. And what she would like to do to set up some sort of transportation between us and her that works for her. Okay. I told her a while ago we would do that and then we got busy and I think that it. All right. How many swallows? Um, I think there is about seven. I think there's a, a group of three. Okay. Um, and then a group of four. Okay. Fledgling, nestling, nestling. Nestling. Okay. Come on in. So this is Sarah. Sarah is one of our amazing staff members here who works her butt off uh, all year long. Uh, we're fortunate to have her. And she's, she's getting baby, baby bird, bird goo. So we just got in a bunch of new baby birds. And that's our 20 minute timer every 20 minutes. All of these guys need to be fed. And then you finish feeding everyone. And then it's 20 minutes. And then you start feeding everyone again. It makes you really admire Mama Bird. <laughs> For sure. Um, and I'm pretty sure they don't wear watches. So <laughs> how do they keep up with it? I'll never know. So these are some of the swallows we've gotten in. Right? They are. These ones, I'm just actually going to make their nest a little tighter because we don't want their legs sitting out like that. These might actually even be wrens. They're very, very tiny. So see that hungry little mouth peeping? He wants to be fed. Um, toilet paper, Sarah. Right here. Am, I, am I blind? Am I not so long? Oh, I'm not going to So we like to line their nests with, um, with toilet paper uh, because we make it soft enough for human butts, which means it's nice and soft and tender and much more tender for these baby birds than um, the uh, paper towel is. So, so these guys are um, now finally warm. They were stone cold and so were these on admission. They were quite cold. And now they're all starting to warm up a bit. And this nest is a little too tall for these guys, so they're going to have a hard time pooping outside of it. Yeah. That's our best guess. Um, usually um, the best person to identify these little guys is uh, the people that we tend to send them to for their care, who all they do are songbirds. And they usually can just tell by the gape uh, of the baby bird. These are so tiny, they might be runs. And then we've got some house finches here. And a little morning dove here, and she's going to be quite different um, feed wise. So, thankfully, with morning doves and pigeons being a different species, they don't feed as often. So, they have a much bigger crop. You see, that's her crop, and it still has some food from when her mom fed her. She was found out of the nest. She's a little bruised. So I think something might have knocked her out of the nest. And because of the rain, she was completely soaked this morning. But she's starting to get a little, feeling a little better. And she's nice and dry now. And thankfully, she will only need to be fed every three to four hours. <laughs> so a lot easier for us to cure. And we'll have some other fledglings. So that's the other thing that we do here that differentiates people find wildlife trying to keep them and raise them themselves not understanding all of their needs nutritional and the demand of the time and keeping them clean and all of those important things uh and and so they they keep them for a while feed them and then we have to deal with the repercussions of that and often they fed them when they were cold which meant their crop was slow so they might have a slow gi tract um, and they're not packing food through regularly. You get some bloat and you get some frog stasis in that scenario. Uh, and that sets us back when we get them because now we've got to just do clear fluids to clear all of that out of them and potentially even start them on antibiotics. And whenever we can, we'd rather not start wildlife on antibiotics because, it, because of course, if you overuse antibiotics in a wildlife population, you're going to create a resistance to those bacteria, much like we've seen in human medicine where 
we've got bugs in hospitals that are, are resistant to almost any antibiotic out there because they've been exposed to so many of them. So you really want to be ethical on your treatment of wildlife with antibiotics and make sure you're not just throwing antibiotics at, at wildlife. We have to make sure they definitely need it. And if we can, we try to avoid using it. Um, so some scenarios like job by cat, we just really can't avoid it. So once um, they kind of graduate beyond, so now they're fledgling stage. So in these little containers, they're usually nestlings. They move beyond that, they become fledglings. Now we can feed them less often. We're exposing them to their diet uh, as well as support feeding them. So we're maybe feeding them every 40 minutes or you see this guy's got a, a thing that says two hours. So we're just supporting them much like their parent would in the wild where we're not gonna get to them you know, every time they're hungry. But if we provide the food for them, in, in as natural of a way as possible, uh, then they're going to learn to go and grab that food themselves. So it's a rather instinctive behavior as long as it's provided to them. So and over time, they start self-feeding and feeding themselves more and more, and then they're able to move to outside aviaries where we're going to see them even less. And uh, they're going to get used to foraging on their own, and then by that point, they're ready to be released. So once songbirds are feeding, uh, self-feeding for about a week or two, they are ready for release. Now we make the assumption that they can find what they need in the wild. And for some species, what we will do is leave sort of what we call a backup food. So up high, not down on the ground, because we don't want to bring them to the ground where predators can get them. We're going to put food up on top of um, platforms that are high that they can come to and they can get that backup food if they need it. So we have an adapted version of our bird goop is one of the things we leave out there so that as they're weaning and eating their natural diet more and more, uh, they can wean themselves off of that goop because they're never going to find that in the wild. <laughs> Not likely anyways. So if you want to watch- Question, you Leah, sorry. As you're, as you're moving to the other location, there's a couple questions here in the Q&A. Um, Great. One okay. is, do you only help uh, wildlife? Yes. Okay. Yes, we, we are not licensed to care for domestic animals, so we don't do that here. Um, we are only caring for wild animals. Okay. And then another question, how many animals are there at the moment? Or maybe just songbirds where you are, and maybe you can tell us around. It's hard to get an idea in the room <laughs> when you were on the video. I'm going to say 30, 40. Yeah, Sarah agrees with me, and she's the one feeding all these hungry mouths today. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 30 to 40 in the room. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. I'm just changing out their nest here because we need to make sure they stay as clean as possible. And they make a mess. So, every time you feed them, you're almost changing out everything each time because they're dirty so some of the some of the attendees are wondering if you have any ducks we do. We can show you ducks when we get to our water bird room. Oh, you have a water bird room. Wow. So this is only the songbird room, folks. There's still so much more to see. So come on out. We can go right to the water bird room first. We were going to stop by Rogers, but we can do that after we check out the ducks. So this is water bird room. And in here we have a variety of species, some of them in aquariums, like our little snipe here. And then we've got these little mergansers. Here's 
we have another margarine there in here. And we are noticing on their chart that many of them are orphans. How does a water bird become an orphan? What could be happening to their parents? Okay, so their parents may have been predicated on, uh, or sometimes they're just separated. A lot of water birds give birth away from the water. Uh, so you'll find ducks and geese in towns where it's safer from predators. And then they walk their young to the water. And in that process of walking the young, you can imagine if they've got 12 little baby ducklings um, full of energy and not necessarily concentrating, mom and, and most of the group might have hit the water and the others got distracted along the way or separated due to traffic. Uh, so in some scenarios, they're trying to cross busy roads and, um, and unfortunately, uh, you get you got a few that are <clears throat> just separated from the group and people come across them and find them and then find us. So mergansers are a fish eating duck. They're a little bit trickier or they're they're one of the more complicated species. Uh, we got a little wood duck in here and then another merganser in here. So it seems to be the year of the mergansers. We already have a group of uh, four mergansers that are out in our aquatic center now. Uh, so they're they're in bigger rooms. We also have some owlets that are they're hanging out in here because it's quieter. <coughs> Sorry, in our raptor room right now. Uh, so these guys are just awaiting transfer to uh, the owl foundation because at the owl foundation they have unreleasable adult birds that will raise these guys. So it's as close as we can get to to having them raised by their natural parents. So um, we're hand feeding them for now, but they're gonna hopefully go off and, and be raised by, by the appropriate parent who will teach them all the appropriate behaviors for, for that species. So that's a screech owl right there. And I think that's what this, yeah, that's a screech as well. Okay. Can I ask a couple more questions while we're sure, definitely. So um two questions about sort of generally in the space. So what what are the most uh what is the most frequent animal that you tend to have come in? Well, it varies. It it really uh fluctuates with the breeding seasons of the different animals. So at the start of the spring, we were inundated with squirrels. So Eastern gray squirrels, red squirrels, mostly those, those two species. Uh, so our small mammal room was like wall-to-wall -wall aquarium full of baby squirrels. And we make litters out of them. That was something I was going to say earlier when we were in Songbird Room that I got myself distracted from. So the difference between wild animals being raised at a center like this is that we will what, you, what they call bundle them. So we will get a bunch of individuals come in and instead of us raising that and it spending most of its time with another with a human and then therefore becoming habituated to humans, we'll raise them with each other. And so they're habituated to their own species. They get to know their own species. And that's one of the big differences from the person who finds an animal thinking, I'm gonna raise this and put it out to the wild. They spend a lot of time with that animal like you would a pet and they habituate the animal to humans. And so then they're not appropriate on relief. For us, when we're raising young orphans, as you can see with how busy we are, we do not have a lot of time to spend with them. We put them in with the same species and they learn from each other the natural behaviors and they learn to recognize what, what their natural species that they should be spending time with looks like. Uh, they end up going out and being much more successful when they're released in the wild that way than, than those that are habituated to humans because eventually they're going to get too close to a human and, and not all humans as we know like wildlife. So uh, they can suffer at the hands of humans if they, if they will approach them. Yeah, so, thank you for that. That's an important thing I think for everyone attending to know that the, the idea is to release them so they can live on their own and their yes. stay is temporary. Yes, so exactly. The next uh, question is about how many hospitals do you have? Uh, uh, I wish I wish we had more than just this one, but this is the only one. 
Um, because this is non-for-profit work too, there's no government funding in, in what we do. So everything you see here has been provided through donations of, from people. Some donations larger, like this actual hospital was donated um, by a, a very wealthy um, couple that lived in the area that uh, had uh, done a lot of research and knew they wanted to donate a substantial sum to a animal charity of some sort. And uh, through uh, seeing what we needed and seeing that we were working out of a tiny little shed before and that we really needed something much bigger, uh, they they helped provide us this. So if it wasn't for their um, very generous donation, we wouldn't even have a hospital. We would still be in our old shed. Uh, trying to manage as much as we could. And at that time we were we were caring for about 2,700 animals a year in the old clinic, which is a lot for it, the size of what we were working out of. It's, just, it's phenomenal we were ever able to do that. Um, now we're seeing about 5,000 and I expect a lot more they share um, patients a year, uh, which means we need we need more space and and more people to manage the care of these animals because what we don't want to see is our care going down with our numbers going up. Uh, it's really important for us here at Sandy Pines to make sure that we are giving good quality care despite the fact we're facing a hurdle of animals coming through the door every day. So that is once again why we have to learn how to make really tough decisions on those that are most likely to succeed. And, and we have to focus our energy there and, and make sure we give them the best opportunity. Uh, and, and for those that we think aren't gonna make it, we try to give them a, a kind way out of the service. Uh, and and uh, if we can, this might sound a little gross to some people, but uh, if we're able to euthanize them in a manner in which they, they can be fed to other animals because we, we're dealing with predators and prey, we will utilize those bodies in feeding them to other animals, which for us feels like full circle. And, um, and that a lot, of, a lot of prey species, that is sort of their role in the food chain is, is, is to eventually be eating, <laughs> eaten by a predator. So um, even though they had to leave this earth, uh, we gave them a gentle kind way of doing so and still fed a predator. So much kinder way to go than what happens to most wild ones when they're out there. And uh, yeah, that's kind of an odd thing for me to go off on a tangent with, but that is a, a reality of what we do is tri in triage is making those decisions. And but, now in this area, we aren't the only wildlife hospitals. Yes. There are others that we work with as well. That's true. Yeah, yeah, we do. And you did already mention the owl center and the songbird center, right? So you can actually move animals to different locations if need be. Yes, exactly, yes, yeah. So, um, and, and not every place is a center. The Owl Foundation is, but some of the people that care for songbirds are just individuals uh, that have a passion for helping out songbirds in particular, and they may not have their own charity per se, um, but they just happen to take on species that, that, that we get into care that they're willing to care for or have the experience with. So. They, you know, we have people that spend a lot of time feeding robins and all kinds of variety of birds. They usually like the, the um, flashier species, let's just say. We, we tend to raise the grackles, the finches, the starlings, the birds that, that not a lot of other people are that keen on. They stay here. Um, but, uh, and we send all the, the fancy birds like bluebirds off to other people to raise. But they are licensed by the Ministry of Natural Resources or um, also Canadian Wildlife uh, Services licenses for um, migratory birds. So without a license from them to keep them in captivity, you can't keep these birds um, in care. So we're licensed by both. So knowing that we have some students on the call, if their families wanted to become a carer of a species like songbirds yeah. is the process then getting a license uh they would have to get a, a license yes to be able to have them in their hands they can sometimes work under our license so the best thing they could do is get in touch with sue uh and if they because a lot of people want to maybe do the nestling side of things or the fledgling side but they don't have aviaries on their property all of our birds are going to go out to large cages outside uh where they'll do their final conditioning oh, not everybody has that so uh, in that scenario, they could simply work under our license, care for those animals for a short period of time, and then um, bring them back to us when they're ready for outside cages. 
Thank you. There are more questions, but I think we should move on with the tour and then I'll find a good spot to ask you the other ones. <laughs> good. Well, I should kick you in the raptor room because it, um, I'm hoping they're in here still. Are our ravens in here? Um, okay. Um, I was looking for the other four. Where are they? They're outside. Um, okay. Yeah. Sorry, our ravens are outside, but they're incredibly adorable. It would have been nice for you to see them, but they are starting to transition. The crows are in here, I believe. Yes, yeah, so yeah, you can hear them. This is Sam. Sam is one of our uh, support staff this year. So yes, you can see these it's incredibly adorable. Crows. You see, because of their intelligent species, they do tend to habituate a little to us. So they're quite used to the fact that humans feed them at this point. But once we get them in outside cages and start uh, having them forage for themselves, they they will become less friendly, as as it could be called. And you'll notice a variety of feather conditioning. So just depending on how long they were orphaned for, it may have damage to some of their feathers. Because they just like, that's, that's the begging behavior they do when they, when they want to be. And now, and now his friend is like, oh, it's that, it's that easy, is it? Don't know where their dish of food is or else I would feed them. Do they have a dish in here? I only see water and I do not see any food. <laughs> Martina, what's on the menu for the crows? Pardon? What's on the menu for crows? Uh, so they got a thing we call Krogu. There's like beef in here, a bunch of different veggies, fruits. I like that. It's a good mixture. She should be in the room. Okay. Some of them are on medication, and you'll find them on in individual pages. No wonder they were begging. <laughs> So they just got their food delivered. Delivery has come in. Oh, we're being creative with this. There's a little carrot in there. All right. Yes, normally we feed them with four sets. And they make that adorable little noise. Oh. Yeah, I can see you wouldn't like cauliflower. I, I'm not sure. Who, uh, yeah. I didn't like the cauliflower, huh? <laughs> We need to make some better for a more eating. Make sure that gets faster. I'm marking. Thank you. We are okay. Can I ask yeah. as we're moving along here, how many rooms do you have in the hospital? Hmm, we have. Let me just be back in a second. Sure, I can answer this question. We have songbird. You can count with me. Raptors, water birds, small mammals, large mammals, our turtle room. Our ICU, that's the intensive care space. Um, and those are all the places where you would find animals. Let's see if I can switch this around here. And then we also have our treatment room and our surgical room and our x-ray room. So th those are the interior spaces of the main building. But then outside, we have an aquatic center, which has several more larger rooms with big pools. And those are really helpful for our patients like ducks or aquatic mammals like beavers. We also have a barn which has big stalls, perfect for foxes or coyotes or some of our larger mammals uh, or family groups as well. So if we get in a family of opossums, for example, the best place for them would to be, be in the barn because we can set up a really big space for them all to be together. 
and then we also have a, a big area of outdoor enclosures, which are for raccoons and foxes and squirrels once they are um, finished their initial treatment inside of the center and are starting to transition to outside okay. spaces um, in preparation for release. And then in addition, we have uh, aviaries, which we spoke about. And I'm actually right behind, or rather in front of our map of the hospital space. So you can see just how large the area is. Um, but we're just at the little hospital right there. Thanks, Jess. That's great. Um, so uh, while we're waiting for Leah, maybe I'll ask you some other questions. Um, there's one um, person wants to know how many of the animals you care for end up surviving or be, I guess, being released back to the wild? That's an excellent question. And we'll actually save that one for Leah because Leah has a much better sense of which patients make it out of triage into our other room um, and which do not make it out of triage. So we'll hold on to that one. Okay, and the next one is, is are we gonna see any mammals? <laughs> We will. I believe our next stop will either be turtles or small mammals. So yes, we will see some small mammals. We have um, over 100 squirrels at the hospital right now. So we'll certainly be able to meet some of them. We also have some long-tailed weasels in our care and a short-tailed weasel. Um, and some bats too who overwintered with us. And because of the cold temperature, we weren't able to release them as early as we would have liked. So a few of them are still in our care. So we do have plenty of mammals in the okay. meat. So it sounds like we're heading to small mammal room next. Um, or turtles? Why do, do you want to go to turtles or small mammals? I'm a, I'm easy, wherever you guys want to go. Let's do we small mammals. We have time for both maybe, hopefully. <laughs> There we go. Okay, let's go to small mammals. Right. <laughs> okay, so this uh, room has actually, believe it or not, gotten uh, a lot more tamer <laughs> than it was a month ago. Um, and the other thing I'd like to show you, because this is like how hard it is to keep things on track around here, we have what's called a treatment chart. So every patient is listed on that that needs uh, to be fed or cared for throughout the day that belongs to the small mammal crew. And they've got um, check marks and boxes that indicate whether or not they need dishes um, or if, whether or not they need bottles or syringes. So um, that's just uh, these very baby young. That I would love to show you guys who's having a nice little snooze right now. So came in eyes closed, eyes are just starting to open. Probably very cranky at the fact that he got woken up without a syringe. So he was very, very short hair when they first uh, come in at that age. Listen to the adorable little noises she makes. Sorry, Leah, is that a skunk? Did you say? That is a baby skunk. Wow. At this age, they would normally still be in the den. So uh, very rare that we get them in uh, when their eyes closed um, because they, if, if mom were to die, they would just pass away in the den. Um, but this little one uh, found his way out of the den. And so um, we've been caring for him for a couple of weeks now and his eyes just started to open. And so he will uh, eventually be fed his milk, um, not from a syringe, um, but he will eventually uh, be fed from a dish and he will also get um, kitten and puppy food mixed in with that uh, to make sure we get him a well-balanced diet. Then we slowly introduce these predatory animals um, to meet over time, um, but we do, and they're in this heavy growing stage, like to keep them on um, whatever's appropriate for them. And we, we do have resources to look this up, other rehabbers that have spent a lot of time working with different species who, who um, put out information letting us know what the appropriate, whether cat or dog is appropriate for that species. So you see, it's much more complicated than a lot of people think. I think you find a wild animal, 
you know, back in the day in the 70s, we would raise them at home. There wasn't any rehabbers. You would figure it the best thing you could feed them. But a lot of those animals, unfortunately, weren't that successful when they were released because they were malnourished at a very critical stage of life. Like, when you think how fast wildlife mature, um, all these different species are growing uh, and able to sustain themselves within a couple of months. So, you know, it takes a human, you know, uh, several years to get to a point and they still can't potentially sustain themselves because it, it argumentatively depends on the child. But um, these guys have to be able to be self-sufficient by the fall and therefore uh, rapid growth in a really short period of time. So a day or two or a week without the proper nutrition can have a really lasting impact on them. And uh, they may never grow the proper fur coat to uh, survive the first winter even uh, because they didn't have all the right nutrients at that young, very vulnerable stage. So this is why we're trying to encourage people to get them into us as quickly as possible, not to hold on to them for a week or two because they think it's a good learning lesson or something like that. Those are some of the stories we've heard in the past. Um, or we've had animals brought in at the end of summer because kids are going back to school and so the parents don't want them around anymore. And these animals are severely malnourished and not going to be ready to be released by fall, if at all. Um, Can so, I ask a question about that? Because a couple of the questions in the Q&A relate yeah, to that. Sure. So yeah. um, sorry to interrupt. I know there's so much to talk about. Um, so there's a question here about how many of the animals you care for survive. And I guess that's a maybe a ratio. Um, yeah, and well, we don't do a lot of monitoring and tracking. Um, you can track and monitor, but you then have to put a device on the animal to do so. And not really our choice to do. We like to step in, help them while they need it, and then put them back out there. And our hope is that they all need it. We have been involved with the Ministry of Natural Resource doing tracking on our raccoons many years ago uh, when they were doing some uh, research with rabies. So we did know at that point, and I suspect it's still the same, that it was a 50% ratio of survival after release for young raccoons. But here's the, get, the great part, that's the same ratio of survival when they were raised by their parents, their mothers. Um, because in the raccoon world, um, the, the males don't spend any time raising the young. Uh, wow, so okay. Knowing that we were getting the same ratio that, that their parents were was a, a really comforting feeling and why we continue to, to you know, put so much effort into the raccoons we raised because we realized we're doing something right if we're getting that same ratio. I suspect it could be even higher in some circumstances with different species, um, but you know, I mean, there isn't much more adaptable in all of the species we have in North America than a raccoon. Uh, they are probably the most intelligent, most adaptable species out there. So if anything could survive, it, it would be raccoons that will learn how to um, forage for themselves fairly quickly. Right. I'm, I'm going to hold the other questions for now because I feel like um, we're kind of running out of time and I'd love to see okay. also some other animals I and maybe like turtles. Animals. So I'll stop, I'll stop uh, occupying your time and you can show us some more animals for the moment and maybe we'll have time for I questions. Love it. They're great questions. Thank you so much. Um, so in, in these other cages, we've got some different, uh, different things. You know, see what we do with the squirrel cages, even when they're young and they're inside, we've got branches in there to expose them. They will actually literally eat those branches. Uh, in the, and so we want them exposed to it as young as possible so they can practice climbing and uh, eating the, their favorite parts of all these different branches. Plus they have a plethora and these two maybe a little too much <laughs> uh, food in the bottom. You'll notice some seeds. We make a seed, corn, um, craisin, al almonds, walnuts, pecans, and rodent chow to give them a well-balanced diet. And we let them forage for that on their own. Now we have some younger ones that just came in today. These guys will mostly be on milk. You see these two little cuties. We have absolutely no um, worries when it comes to baby squirrels as far as whether or not they're an orphan or whether or not people are kidnapping them. Young squirrels will approach people when they need help. So we know as soon as they're doing that, their mom can't be around. If so, if they're following you. Uh, that's one of the common stories we get, following, approaching people when they're sitting on their deck. That's, that's a young squirrel's way of saying, I need your help. And this one's just loving the heat and uh, 
and so far they've had uh, a honey water mixture we use for hydrating them. They're just adorable. Doesn't get much cuter than that. One of the one of the participants here is asking if you give the animals names. We did the odd one, but when you're raising, like I think at the end of the year we'll raise. Um, so some of them do get names, tend to be the ones that we get in even younger, but it, it's often just nicknames. Um, raccoons, we do name some of them, um, but we give them a general, like a general name. It just makes it easier for us when communicating their care to each other. So with young raccoon litters, we usually pick like either the location they came from, the last name of the finder. Uh, the street they were on, something like that, and we'll and we'll come like we have a, a pair that came from Port Hope. They're the Hope, uh, as an example. So it's sort of a, a kind of a generic name, um, and we don't necessarily have individual names for them, uh, but something that we can refer to when we all know what we're talking about, rather than just a number. And certainly, with the the amount of patients we get in here, we couldn't even use their case numbers. <laughs> Uh, because it, you know, it just doesn't roll off the tongue like number 2,311. <laughs> it's not something everybody's going to recognize, but certainly, you know, the, ba the baby skunk, um, that, that's something that, that we will. And I'm sure they, you know, there's little things you end up calling them when you're feeding them, like little chunk or something like that. And that catches on around here. I know some rehabbers name all of their babies, but um, we deal with such a huge amount of them that it's very difficult. So sort of names uh, uh, that go with the whole group is more what we do. So Leah, we only have a few minutes left. So shall we go to turtles? Yes, let's go to turtles. I have an interesting one for you guys today. There's a few in here that you'll see. But one that we did this morning. So we do have some hatchlings. So hatchlings that hatched it that were found that were a little small. This guy's ready to be released, so we can get him back out into water. So what happens with painted turtles, um, interesting enough, is some of them will hatch in the fall and they have a natural antifreeze that prevents their blood from freezing over winter. And they will instead of leaving their nest, they will, hiber they will hibernate their first winter in their nest and then crawl out of the nest in the spring. So unlike other species where we wouldn't expect to see a hatchling in the spring, with painted, you can sometimes see hatchlings in spring. Oh, I think Julia is getting ready to, are we feeding the weasels? It has a mate. The mate. Yeah. Um, can they take a look in there? You want to show them? Yeah. has been working with the mate. She's our Grabby's vector and also um, weasel specialist. <laughs> she does a great job raising the muscle Oh, look at her. She's grown so much. Yep. Good job, Lee. <laughs> Okay, so as you can see, we've got some turtles that are already at the stage of being put into water uh, to see how their shell holds up. Um, that guy's hiding, but this one's out basking. How many different kinds of turtles do you have there right now? Yeah, I think we, we have about three different kinds right now. We have, oh, yeah, I think our snapper got transferred. So um, three to four. I know we have a map turtle, we have landing turtles, we have painted turtles are the most common we have right now. And we have had some snapping turtles. Um, we do work in conjunction with the Ontario Turtle Conservation Center. And uh, they are very keen to get lots of turtles in there because they have new, new space. And in order to try to help us deal with all of the different species, we've been sending quite a few their way. The, some of the trickier are gonna take more time um, going to require longer term in care or potential surgery, we will ship up there uh, and their veterinarians will do surgery on them. And then we're keeping the ones that are pretty basic and we'll likely have them back out in the wild in a couple of months here. Um, how many, um, what's sort of the longest time an animal um, has stayed with you? 
Um, it, it varies. I think the longest is, is going to be for us anyways, a year, um, maybe a year and a half. We had one turtle that um, had been kept as a pet, uh, unfortunately, and fed a very inappropriate diet. And um, it had a lot of shell issues because of this and was getting chronic infections in the shell. And it took us about a year and a half to clear that up and finally get that turtle out in the wild. Um, so I'd say some of the turtles are the ones that stay the longest. Uh, and then most of the mammals are usually only here for several months or less. And um, occasionally you get a bird. We had a bird with a red tail hawk that had head trauma uh, that took a long time to regain the pathway from the brain to the feet. Uh, so she was doing really good and eating well, but she wasn't landing well and she couldn't capture prey. Uh, so we kept her and I honestly wasn't sure she was going to make it to release, but she did in the end pass um, all of her testing as far as being able to capture prey and was released. But she, so it just took her brain. And that's the thing with head trauma is it, it's variable uh, in among species and within a species, it can be variable as we know for humans, we're learning more and more about concussions and head trauma in humans. And certainly, um, you know, what might take one person a month to heal from could take another a year. And, and you can see that same thing with head trauma and wildlife is that uh, the brain reworks its pathway in the time it takes. Uh, some of the turtles that we've kept for a long time have had hind end paralysis. It's the same kind of thing. There's a disconnect along the central nervous system to the brain. And so these animals need to rewire that if possible. And we've given them uh, about a year in captivity and done physio and a bunch of other things with them to try to encourage that use. And we've been able to release them. So, wow. Uh, those are always great That's stories. Quite, it's quite incredible. Um, I, I'm afraid we're going to have to cut this short quickly if, if there's another animal you really love to show us because um, you have another. Um, today that's quite a view. Um, now I'm biased because map turtles are my favorite species of all the turtles. Uh, and you'll see this one um, is a large, large map turtle. So in all likelihood, I haven't x-rayed her yet. I will x-ray her to see if she has eggs. Um, but uh, she, she got hit very hard in the back here and that was all loose earlier today. So, uh, and a lot of blood coming out of it. So I've put a uh, gauze that is supposed to help stop um, bleeding uh in there and um and i've used uh a bandage tape and um crazy glue to piece it all back together so yeah send out all of your all of your positive thoughts for healing for this map turtle in our hopes that we can get her better and get her back out there and have her continue to be a breeding member of the population wow wonderful that's a lot of work tape and crazy glue yeah, who thought, right? So slow down, everybody, when you're driving near any lakes, because now's the time exactly. that that kind of stuff happens, that turtles get hit by accident. Well, unfortunately, we have uh, very little time left, but thank you so much, Leah, um, for a small glimpse into your world and your busy life. And it has been really wonderful to see um, and thanks for telling us all about it. Um, and I'm sorry to everybody who has asked more questions. There were so many questions I couldn't keep up with. So um, maybe Jess can put in um, the chat when she gets a minute, or maybe Monica or Arena, uh, a way to get a hold of Sandy Pines Wildlife Center, a way to help donate, um, to help uh, the really amazing work that you're doing. Um, so thank you, Leah, and we'll let you get back to work now. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day.